ensure that uh, everyone's on mute and remains on mute throughout the presentation. Um, you will have the opportunity to ask questions um, in the chat. We are asking you to please hold those questions until um, the end, if at all possible, um, so that we can see them all at once. And so if there are any duplicates, we can, um, we can sort through those. Um, if you are dialing in only, you might want to consider adding the video option um, as Dr. Barker will be sharing her screen. Um, and then if you are dialing in only and don't feel like um, sharing, you know, exercising the video option, um, we will have this recording available. Um, it will be available tomorrow. Um, or, and you can, if you have questions, you can email me at cbassie at drew.edu. And I'll type that in the chat box um, later as well. Um, I'm not going to have access to the email that was included on the original invitation, but I will have access to my, um, my personal Drew email. Um, and so with that said, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brianne Barker. She is an associate professor of biology at Drew um, and a specialist in virology and immunology. She has a BS in biology from Duke University and a PhD in immunology from Harvard University. Dr. Barker is a regular contributor on podcasts sponsored by This Week in Virology, most recently involved with their weekly podcasts on coronavirus. I'm pleased to introduce her now to speak with you on coronavirus biology, separating fact from fiction. All right, thank you very much. Let's see if we can make this work. Okay, can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Yes. All right. Okay, thumbs up. Right. Great. Thumbs up works. Okay, um, thank you so much uh, everyone for coming. Um, and I hope that you find this to be an interesting um, conversation. Um, I would also just like to quickly point out that um, the response to any sort of pandemic is uh, very much a multidisciplinary response. And so I'm going to be able to talk about the virology of this response, but truly understanding it would of course require uh, people from all different types of disciplines. Uh, this is the information that I presented earlier this week to my microbiology students um, that I hope that you will find very helpful. Many people in my field have been providing quite a lot of info to the public. Um, there are a couple of slides um, that I have adapted from those made by Florian Kramer, who is an expert on all of this at Icon's Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and the citations for those slides are on them. Um, I'm first going to spend a little bit of time talking about some aspects of the virology, um, which I like to talk about, but also hopefully will be some important context for you all. And then I'll move into talking about aspects of the epidemiology and preventative measures um, that can happen with uh, dealing with this virus. Let's see here. Okay, so the um, this whole thing started um, when there were some reports of atypical pneumonia that were made to the World Health Organization on December 31st, 2019. Um, these were reports of this disease from Wuhan, China, which was the location where a particular market, um, a seafood and market that also sold other things, um, happened. And originally that was sort of what we thought was going on here. Um, when we have continued to do additional types of investigation, we realized that that market and those reports on New Year's Eve were probably not the beginning of this whole story. These data show information on people who were diagnosed with cases of this disease at different times. Um, these are all cases, early cases from China. And what you should notice is that the first case shown here was on December 1st, 2019. Um, there is a little bit of evidence there may be some cases before that, um, but this does go back a bit uh, to December. You should also notice that there are some cases listed here in blue, which were not associated with that market. And so while we originally thought this was all about some um, seafood market um, in a particular area, um, the specifics of the origin um, are actually uh, not quite that clear. 
Um, so at the beginning, as I said, this was an outbreak of pneumonia that was atypical in a number of different patients. Um, people in my field have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with the movie Contagion. Um, and the thing that we often joke about with the movie Contagion is that the scientists in that movie find out information about their new infectious disease incredibly quickly. And we often say, boy, I wish we could learn things that quickly. That would be great. Um, it turns out in this case, um, scientists were able to use some um, DNA sequencing methods to understand what this virus was and to in fact understand that these patients had a new virus called, uh, that was a novel coronavirus um, by January 10th, um, which many of us jokingly said was sort of at contagion level speed. Um, and so by January 10th, researchers from um, some areas of China as well as in Australia were able to determine that the um, new uh, infection that we were seeing was actually caused by this virus, this novel coronavirus. That made a lot of sense um, and was very interesting to those of us who were virologists. But for those of you who may not know a whole lot about virology, you may say, oh, what, what's a coronavirus and why does that seem so interesting to you? Um, well, first of all, let me re remind you that viruses are what um, biologists call obligate intracellular parasites. And that's a fancy way of saying that they need a cell in order to reproduce. They can't reproduce or really do anything on their own. They need to take over one of our cells. Um, this virus is from a family known as Coronaviridae. It was named Coronaviridae um, because in pictures from a microscope, which are shown on the top of this slide, people thought that it looked like a crown. Um, I'll let you decide for yourself about um, what you think matches there. Um, it was realized that this virus had a genome that was made up of RNA. Um, officially, we call it positive sense single-stranded RNA. You have a DNA genome. Um, and the most important thing I wanted to, I will point out about this virus is that it's an enveloped virus, which means that it has an outside layer that's made out of lipids. And that is shown as the purple membrane in the virus cartoon that is shown on the lower left-hand part of this slide. When I started graduate school, coronaviruses were sort of a curiosity in virology. There were two that were particularly famous. Um, one caused diarrhea in pigs and the other caused diarrhea in cows. Um, we'd known about them since the 60s, but nobody spent a whole lot of time thinking much about them. There were a few that were known to infect humans. Um, there were four and they're listed here. They were known to cause about 30% of all cases of the common cold. Um, but they weren't studied particularly extensively. No one really thought that they were a very big deal. Um, a lot of virologists weren't particularly interested in them. That all changed in uh, 2003. In 2003, there was a new outbreak and it was caused by a coronavirus. We now know this as the SARS outbreak, um, which was a disease called severe acute respiratory syndrome. And this was an outbreak of atypical pneumonia with an unknown cause from the Guangdong province in China. It was later shown to have been caused by a virus called SARS coronavirus or SARS-CoV. Um, and it spread to over 8,000 people in 29 countries and had a 9.6% mortality rate. I have two things to show you about SARS at the top of this slide. At the, on the left-hand side, um, you can see SARS cases by week of onset. And what you should notice is that the earliest cases were in late 2002, early 2003, and this whole thing was over by July of 2003. Um, so SARS was contained very quickly, partially due to some of the public health measures that were put in place um, in order to stop that virus. Um, and we really have not seen that virus since 2003. 
you should also know that there's one other interesting observation that has been made about SARS. On the right hand side of this slide, there is a list or a graph that shows you fatality rates um, in three different cities um, with SARS infection. And these fatality rates are broken down by different age groups. What you, may, what you should notice is that SARS seems to have um, a particularly high fatality rate and lead to quite a few deaths in a population of older individuals. Um, and that seems to be a rather unique feature of SARS. Um, as I mentioned, SARS went away at the end of 2003, but virologists were sort of on notice and had started to think of coronaviruses as potentially interesting. In 2012, they realized that, yes, in fact, these were somewhat interesting viruses because another new coronavirus led to an outbreak. Um, this led to the disease called MERS or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which was another type of severe respiratory illness. Um, some people with MERS seem to have very mild symptoms like a cold. Some seem to have rather inapparent infections um, where they don't see any symptoms at all. Um, but as you can see from uh, the graph that I show at the top here, um, there also was a rather large fatality rate in an older population. Um, most of the people who died and who had serious disease had some sort of other um, health issues at the same time that led to uh, potential problems. This was shown to be caused by another coronavirus, MERS coronavirus. Um, to this point, there have been 2,494 cases at 858 deaths. Um, and there are sporadically still new cases of MERS from time to time in a few places throughout the world. All of these coronaviruses, whether they are the um, common coronaviruses that cause um, the cold, whether they are SARS, whether they are MERS, all seem to um, be what are known as zoonotic viruses, um, which are viruses that are transmitted um, to the human population from animals. That doesn't mean that every person who is infected comes in contact with an infected animal. It means that there was some initial event where a person came in contact with an animal, um, acquired the virus and got sick, and then we saw continued spread from person to person. Um, and so many of those cold viruses seem to um, come from originally from bats and then through some other intermediate um, organism. When I first started um, putting all of this material together, I in fact learned about one of them coming from llamas that I hadn't known about before. Um, and you can see that many of the, but the others like SARS will come, uh, seems to have originally come from bats and then through an organism called a civet. MERS seems to have come from bats and then something called a camel. You know what a camel is. That was silly phrasing. Um, and uh, we were able to see quite a few of these different um, types of zoonotic infections. And so this is sort of another really interesting feature of coronaviruses. At this point, scientists realized that perhaps they needed to get a better idea of what was out there in terms of different types of coronaviruses. They did quite a few different studies and they found that there were tons of coronaviruses in nature. Um, these are two studies from a researcher at the University of North Carolina from, uh, named Ralph Barrick, although there are many such studies. Um, and they indicate that there seem to be a lot of coronaviruses that might be ready to spill over. Um, and so based on these data, as well as um, the knowledge that SARS spilled over um, and was a member of this family, um, MERS spilled over and was a member of this family. Um, you might note that coronaviruses seem to be sort of a, an up and coming virus type. Um, there also have been three outbreaks of coronaviruses that have spilled over in um, swine populations in the 21st century. So these seem to be a group of viruses that are really sort of on the move right now. Of course, the reason why I tell you about all of this is that we've realized that the disease that we are seeing right now, um, the coronavirus um, 
infectious disease, which the World Health Organization has named COVID-19 for coronavirus infectious disease that started in 2019. Um, is caused by yet another zoonotic coronavirus. And in some more rather heroic science from um, many investigators, by um, February 3rd, um, there was a publication of the, uh, this vi the virus that was causing this disease, um, details of the biology of the virus, the sequence of the virus, um, and all sorts of additional information. And um, on the right hand side, um, you can see some information that tells you that most of this virus looks pretty similar to yet another coronavirus from bats. Um, there's only one part that's a little bit different. It's the part that's on the right hand side um, where the plot seems to go down in a little spike. Um, I apologize if I'm describing things interestingly. Zoom is covering up most of my slides, uh, and I'm describing them somewhat from memory. Um, but that uh, little spike that is shown is the one place where this virus looks different from a bat coronavirus, and it looks like a virus from another organism called a pangolin. Um, people are still trying to figure out exactly what that means. Um, so this virus, um, has been named, um, strangely enough, it was named on the same day that the World Health Organization called it uh, COVID-19. Um, the virology community named this virus SARS-CoV-2. Um, no one in the public seems to have heard that name. Um, but this virus was discovered and leads to this set of COVID-19 symptoms. Um, the most frequent symptoms that we see in patients with this um, infection are a fever, um, and recent studies have said that 87.9% um, of people with um, this infection uh, seem to have fever. Um, the next most common symptoms are cough um, as well as fatigue. Um, and then things like breathing difficulties and aches seem to be some of the most common uh, the, some of the most common um, symptoms that we see in patients. Um, in addition, what you can notice is that um, on the right, you can see that um, about 81% of patients seem to have mild disease, maybe like the flu that would cause them to stay at home, or maybe even symptoms that are so mild, they don't quite notice that they're sick. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm not feeling so well, I sort of tell myself it's not really, it's all in my head and that I'm totally fine and going to be there. And maybe that's the case in some of these patients. Um, about 13% um, of the patients have uh, severe disease, um, severe enough for them to be hospitalized, while about 5% um, are, are able, are actually in a situation where they need to have um, critical care um, and that might include things like um, being in the intensive care unit um, or other types of very important um, uh, care that they will require. One of the things that many people um, have uh, asked in on the news and in the media um, now is that has to do with uh, aspects of the epidemiology and the infection with coronavirus. And so these data um, indicate uh, to uh, many of us that um, this disease, just like SARS and just like MERS, has a particularly high um, uh, fatality rate, again, in an older population. You can see different age groups on the left-hand side of the image. And in each age group, there are two bars. One of them is in red, and that shows the percent of cases in that age group that are fatal. You also can see that there are some blue striped bars, which um, are the percent of cases in that age group that are confirmed. Those are the people in that age group who are infected. 
So there are two things I'd like to point out here. First of all, we do seem to see a much higher death rate in older populations compared with younger populations. Um, and many people are talking about the fact that children do not seem to be severely affected. And that is quite obvious from here. You can see how low the fatality rate is in the 10 to 19 year old age group. And in fact, there have been no fatalities seen in the zero to nine age group. You should also notice, however, that in those age groups, there is still a bar with blue hash marks um, which tells you that we do see infections in those individuals. They just don't seem to get very sick. So they have the virus, but the virus seems to be mild in them. Um, overall, the fatality rate seems to be about 2.3%. However, um, I'm going to give you some caveats to that um, as I move forward. Um, there seem to be some differences in men and in women, whether that is real um, or whether that is related to other details like um, percentage of males versus females who are smokers um, or just sort of the numbers of cases that we have seen very early on is not really clear. Um, most of the patients who have severe disease have some other type of comorbidity like hypertension or diabetes or something like cardiovascular disease um, or um, something like that. In fact, um, more recent data that we have seen oops, um, indicates that hypertension does seem to be a rather strong um, correlate to severe disease. Um, in addition, we do see that um, many of the fatal cases are in the hospital for a long period of time um, and require quite a bit of care um, long term. And just so that you um, have this comparison, because again, um, this is a comparison that's being made in a lot of different venues right now. Um, with, there are different ways of thinking about fatality rates, but the fatality rate for seasonal flu is usually thought to be about 0.1%. Um, here I'm telling you that the fatality rate for COVID-19 is 2.3%, although I will note in a second that that number is a little bit uh, uncertain right now. Um, we don't know why children are uh, affected so much less severely. One reason might be because they are frequently getting some of the other coronaviruses as common colds um, and have a little bit of immune protection. It also might be because there are some biological differences in their lungs um, that allow them to have a different response to this respiratory virus. I mentioned something about aspects of case fatality rates before. And here you can see some additional information about fatality rates of this virus um, in different countries, um, showing both the number of deaths and the number of cases that were seen. Um, and what you can notice is that there is a large variation um, in the fatality rate in different countries. Um, that may have something to do with the healthcare availability and whether or not a, a country's health system has been overwhelmed, but it also probably has to do with the somewhat low numbers we're looking at in some of these countries and the fact that these data may not be terribly statistically robust. One of the courses that I teach at Drew is called Emerging Infectious Disease. So this is very much within things I would teach in that course. And one of the things I talk about pretty frequently in the Emerging Infectious Disease course is that typically early in an epidemic, the case fatality rate that we see is much higher than the actual case fatality rate. And that is because we typically um, are diagnosing only very sick patients at the beginning of the epidemic. We typically are going to see patients who are very sick, who may have severe pneumonia, and we decide to investigate what is wrong with them. Um, we aren't necessarily going to do surveillance on every single person in the population at that early part of the epidemic to see why they might have a runny nose. 
Um, and the example I often talk about in class is with West Nile virus, which people in this part of the world certainly know quite a bit about. Um, in the first year of West Nile, there were seven deaths out of 62 cases, which is an 11% fatality rate. We now know that 80% of people who get West Nile have no symptoms. Um, and when we calculate the fatality rate, the fatality rate is really 0.1%. Um, and so while we can calculate these fatality rates right now, we also should be aware that most likely the real fatality rate of this infection is lower than what we are calculating. Um, officially, if we are going to calculate a fatality rate, we need to know the number of people who have died and we would divide by the number who have recovered. Um, that is a very difficult calculation to do. We most frequently look at the uh, case fatality rate, which again, we need to know the number of cases. We need to know about all of those people who were asymptomatic or who were not diagnosed to properly come up with that number. Um, most people really care about the infection fatality rate, um, which is the number of deaths um, divided by the number of infected. But again, here we need to know the number of people who were actually infected. Typically, we find that out um, in years after the epidemic is over when we're able to actually look at um, what types of immune responses patients have made in the time uh, intervening. That would, of course, bring us to thinking about aspects of testing. Um, there is, of course, a test for uh, co the COVID-19 disease that we see from SARS coronavirus infection. Um, this test allows um, the physician or the testing agency to look for the nucleic acid from the virus and see if it's present in a patient. Um, of course, um, making all of the, shall we call them, ingredients um, to put this test together um, does take a little bit of time. Um, and um, you may have heard about um, some of the issues that have happened there. Um, and right now, um, we feel as we seem as to know that if there are people who are very ill, we're going to test them. And if there are people who can be managed by staying home because they have symptoms like the flu, um, it's probably better for them to stay home. Um, and um, I'll mention something else about that as I go forward. Um, people often also ask questions about how infectious this virus is. Sometimes people confuse the idea of virus infectiousness with the ability of a virus to lead to fatality. Um, there is a something called the um, R-naught or reproductive number for a virus. It's basically how many people each case will lead to um, new infections. And so um, I described that really poorly. Um, so it's basically about how many new infections come from each individual infected person. Um, so in the case of measles, one person who is infected will generally lead to between 12 and 18 additional infections. Um, in the case of Ebola, that number is about two. We think that for this virus, SARS-CoV-2, that the reproductive number is about two to three. Um, and though, again, because we are doing this very quickly, um, and we are doing this in the middle of an outbreak, um, we don't quite have all the data for this to be uh, perfect. Um, and we are sort of assuming that the proportion of the population that will get infected may be about 30 to 40 percent, although I will caution you that I have seen a huge range um, for those data. Um, here you can see some uh, the number of cases um, that has been seen around the world um, from late January up until March 10th. And so you can see that we've been experiencing a rather rapid increase um, in cases over time around the world. Um, this is certainly uh, has not yet shown any um, sign of slowing down. If you want to look at much of the um, most up-to-date information on this, um, this website from Johns Hopkins University um, actually gives the full list of confirmed cases 
um, deaths as well as recovered cases. I think people often look at the confirmed cases and feel really worried about how many people are currently sick and don't think about the fact that many of them have already recovered. Um, you can also see how many cases are present in different areas of the world. You can zoom in or out um, on different parts of the world to understand cases there. And in the lower right hand corner, you can see um, the case increase uh, per day. Um, and so what you also should note here is that um, the yellow is the cases in mainland China. The green um, are the recovered cases and the I'm sorry, the orange was mainland China, the yellow is locations outside of China. And so you can see that there is uh, very much a, a large increase still happening in infections with this virus. Um, and here are the data from the Centers for Disease Control or the CDC on COVID-19 cases in the United States. Um, these are cases that have been reported to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta cases are only reported to the CDC um, once they have tested positive in a state lab. Um, and so the state labs may have slightly different numbers than what you see here because we are in process of having those data sent to the CDC. Um, you may look at the data that I've shown you on the last couple of slides and you may think, oh my goodness, this is terrible. Um, I, I'm going to run away from every person I see who sniffles um, or who starts to cough even a little. Um, one thing that I want to point out to you is that um, the uh, number of people who are sick due to other things at this point, like colds, um, is going to be much greater than what you're seeing with people with COVID-19. Most likely, if you are coming in contact um, or if you are feeling some of these symptoms, you may have something that is like a cold or a flu, uh, given that this is cold and flu season. Um, there are some specific features that will distinguish the COVID-19 infection from um, other types of infections, um, particularly the flu. And so things like a fever, or things like fatigue um, may be very uh, important for distinguishing um, this infection. This is really important because when you are feeling ill, your first step should probably be to call your doctor's office um, and they will ask you some questions about your symptoms because they're trying to determine if you have a cold or the flu or COVID-19 and how they should deal with you in their um, waiting room. Um, and so this type of information is important for you to realize that um, you don't need to worry about everyone who has any sort of respiratory infection right now. Um, and to realize that there are some pretty specific symptoms that we see with this disease. Um, this virus is a respiratory virus um, and it is spread through what are known as respiratory droplets. And so you can see a person who is infected on the left um, and who may um, give out uh, different types of respiratory droplets. They start out pretty big and you can see the droplets near the infected person are on the larger side. Um, those droplets are also pretty wet. Um, they tend to be rather heavy and they tend to fall out of the air pretty quickly. Um, they don't stay in the air for very long. Only some of the smaller droplets um, will make it very far in the air and will actually potentially go towards other people. Um, and the stability of whether or not we're going to have big droplets hanging around has a lot to do with um, seasonality of different types of viral infections. Um, the humidity in the air and the temperature um, seems to really uh, have a lot to do with whether or not those droplets will um, remain stable. Um, this information is part of the reason um, why sometimes there's confusion about whether some type of uh, virus is airborne or not. Um, airborne means a pretty specific thing um, to people in uh, the virology field. Um, so to us, airborne means that the virus can actually travel in those little tiny dry droplets over long distances. Um, 
it, the larger wet droplets that go for smaller distances are really part of something we call droplet spread. Um, and many viruses are able to spread through those droplets, but can't spread through longer term um, types of um, smaller aerosol droplets. Um, and that is something that we're still working on understanding for this virus. Um, this also relates to details regarding masks. Um, masks do a great job at blocking those very large droplets from coming out of uh, an infected individual, um, but they don't do as good a job stopping the smaller droplets. Um, so if these um, types of materials are um, in your environment, they could potentially lead to the virus entering your body in a few different ways. Um, most of your body, if you go ahead and take a look at another person, uh, most of the surface that might come in contact with that virus is the skin. That's the thing that you have quite a lot of in terms of surface area. The skin is a really great barrier to viral infection. The top layer of the skin is completely composed of dead cells. And I mentioned before that viruses need cells in order to reproduce. Dead cells are completely useless for a virus. And so the fact that you have a layer of dead cells making up your skin gives you this amazing um, type of protection from viruses. The viruses are only going to really be able to get into your body and start reproducing if they happen to luck out and find some type of mucosal surface, um, which happens to be one of your surfaces that has live cells um, and cells that are in a wet environment, like the conjunctiva or um, the nose or mouth or other parts of the respiratory tract. Um, but if you think about it, those are a relatively uh, small sort of surface area of your body compared to the skin. Um, and so one of the things that you can really do in order to help protect yourself um, from one of these viruses is try to make sure that those viruses won't make their way to one of those mucosal surfaces. Um, and the best way that you can do that is by using some good old fashioned soap and water. Um, and so um, if you look at um, that top layer of your skin, it's made of a bunch of skin cells that are shown here in beige. Um, and the lipids on your skin cells, as well as um, other proteins on skin cells and the proteins and lipids on your virus really like to stick to one another. So while the virus can't use your skin for much of anything, it's a surface that the virus loves to attach onto and just sort of hang out on. Soap is also a molecule that has some lipid parts to it. This is very much not to scale for any of my science colleagues who are here. Um, and soap has the ability to get in between the viruses and your cells. The lipids in the soap will like to bind to the lipids in your skin, the lipids in the soap like to bind to the virus, and in fact, the soap will pull the virus right off of your skin. Um, and so this is why doing things like washing with soap and water will help. Um, although there is one additional benefit. Um, the virus, as I mentioned before, has a nice lipid bilayer, which is shown in purple. Um, and the soap has some lipids as well. Those soap lipids, can actually um, embed themselves into the viral lipids. And as a result, the virus will in fact be destroyed um, and will completely come apart. Um, and so um, things like uh, good old fashioned soap and water are gonna do a great job in actually getting that virus off of your skin, um, which means that you will have less of a chance of having virus on your skin that you could manage to then touch one of your mucosal surfaces with in order to lead to infection. So somewhat lower chance that the virus is going to find the mucosal surface on its own, but since the skin is really nice and sticky, your skin is a great place where the virus could hang out for a little while until it gets the opportunity to come in contact with the mucosal surface. Um, hand sanitizers contain um, alcohol, 
Um, and that alcohol is able to, um, inter to bind to the lipids on the virus and cell membranes um, pretty well, um, although it takes longer and it takes more alcohol than it does soap. So hand sanitizer will be active against this virus. There are some um, misconceptions that hand sanitizer might not be active against viruses um, that are out there. And if the virus has an envelope, um, it will work well. However, um, it is not as good um, either in terms of ability to remove things from your skin or the amount of time that it takes um, in order to um, remove viruses from your skin. Um, you also might think about some of the surfaces that are present um, in your uh, environment. Um, because I'm part of this podcast, um, This Week in Virology, we have had a number of different virologists actually send us data that is not yet published. Um, this is some of that data. And the investigator has actually specifically asked us to share it as broadly as possible because he thinks this would be really important. Um, and this uh, set of investigators actually looked at how long the virus is stable on different types of surfaces like um, copper or cardboard or steel or plastic, as well as how long virus lived in the air. Um, and so this is a question that many people have been asking. You can see that the virus is able to live for um, about 2.74 or can be detected out to three hours um, in air, um, four hours on copper, 24 hours on cardboard. Um, and all of these things show us the importance of um, frequently disinfecting the surfaces in our environment in order to remove this virus um, so that we don't potentially touch that uh, surface and then bring the virus into our um, uh, mucosal surfaces. All of these things are things that you might look at and you might say, okay, those are, those are fine. But I really want to be, I want to have some sort of great treatment. I want a vaccine. I want some sort of medical intervention to help me. And so you might want to know about what types of treatments or vaccines are available. Right now, patients are receiving supportive therapy um, in terms of things like hydration um, and other types of medical care. There are multiple drugs that are in clinical trials. Because this virus is quite similar to uh, SARS and MERS, we can take advantage of the research that has been done on SARS and MERS and our knowledge of different uh, drugs that seem to work for SARS and MERS. There are two different drugs that are uh, somewhat advanced in trials for um, these types of infections. And so it does seem as though um, we may be able to have some of those treatments used for something like compassionate use in the future. There are also some patients who, in China who are currently being treated with what's known as convalescent serum, which is when um, people who are recovered from the disease donate some blood and antibodies from their blood are taken and given to others in order to help um, those people get better by using antibodies from survivors. Um, vaccines, of course, are certainly underway by many investigators, though we generally think that vaccines are going to take um, between about six to 18 months, um, given all of the many processes that have to happen to make sure that our vaccines are both safe and effective. Um, and all of these things um, lead to us thinking about some of the other measures that we may need to think about. And, we are thinking more and more about other types of preventative or protective measures. Um, we can imagine um, the curves that I showed you previously of the infection increasing at a very rapid rate, sort of like the matches that are on the left here that seem to have burned one after the other. But you can see that the matches on the right are protected because there was a stop in this chain um, of um, spread. Um, similarly, we can think about ways that we can stop chains of transmission in order to protect different individuals and stop the spread of this virus. This is really important um, for everyone to think about. Some people may look at some of the information about this virus and say, well, I'm, I'm young and healthy. Um, I don't think that I'm at particular risk and I'm not too worried. Um, 
However, part of the reason why you want to take protective measures is not only to protect yourself, but to protect all of your community members who may be immunocompromised, who may have some sort of other medical condition that makes them more at risk, who may be in um, a population or age group that makes them more at risk. If we all work to stop the spread of transmission of this virus, then we can um, help protect all of those other members of our community. Um, this is um, a, a plot that's been going around quite a bit that shows what those protective measures might be able to do. In red, you can see what this epidemic might look like without protective measures. You could see a rapid increase in a number of in cases. Um, if we put in some of these other protective measures, um, then the epidemic might look a little bit more like what we're seeing in blue. You see that there still are a quite a few people who are infected. They're infected over a longer period of time, but there are fewer people infected at any one time. And that can be really important for our healthcare system's ability to care for patients, um, to make sure that um, our hospitals and our healthcare workers are safe places for people with this infectious disease, but also people with other types of medical problems um, to be seen. And so this will help keep our healthcare system in um, good shape. This is sort of a new and unprecedented situation. Um, most of us who are working in infectious diseases right now often um, are sort of looking at each other and wondering how in the world we got here um, and how we ended up being sort of the experts instead of sitting in our office grading papers and doing some experiments all day. Um, and we have relatively few models that we can use. None of them are great models for comparison, um, but one model that I would like to show you, and again, it has some flaws in it, um, is the model of 1918, during the influenza pandemic in 1918. Um, the city of Philadelphia did not um, put in place different types of measures for social distancing, while the city of St. Louis did. Um, and you can see that um, the epidemics in Philadelphia shown in the solid lines and the epidemic in St. Louis shown in the dotted lines looked very different. Um, and so at this point, we're all sort of hoping that we can have our community's outcomes look a little bit more like what we've seen in St. Louis. This is why many of the preventative measures like social distancing um, that you're seeing going on um, around the world are so very important. Um, and so as a result, um, thinking about things like going online to Zoom presentations um, or uh, classes can be really important. Similarly, staying home when possible um, is important, as is being healthy for other reasons and not needing to go to the healthcare centers for other reasons. So getting a flu vaccine and otherwise making sure that you're healthy, uh, making sure that your immune system is staying strong, um, through all of the ways that you can help take care of yourself um, are all really important things. Um, some people will look at all of this information and they will say, well, I, I feel like we need to also be concerned about the flu. They may talk about the number of people in the United States who suffer from flu infections every year. There are some similarities and some differences here, but the great thing is that all of these preventative measures of social distance and of um, things like um, hand washing and all of the others are going to be um, able to help us prevent the spread of all of those infectious diseases, not just COVID-19, and will hopefully help us all um, protect our community members to make sure that we're living in a healthy and safe community. Um, thank you all very much. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. I hid the chat window so I couldn't see questions, um, but I'll take a look at them in just a second. Um, and thank you all very much for listening. So Brianna, I can I can read you the questions if Brianna, if, if that works for you. Sure. I think there are a couple people who may have done them privately. Um, but yeah, go ahead and you can go ahead and read the questions. Okay. Um, do you want to go through the private ones first? Uh, sure. Brianna, um, Brianna, could you unshare your screen so that we can see you when you're answering the questions? I sure can. No, thank you. No so. problem. Um, so um, I have one person who asked about 
Um, the main differences between uh, the COVID-19 infection, uh, SARS and MERS, um, a lot of the symptoms seem to be very similar. Um, but the big difference that we really seem to see is how these viruses transmit from person to person. Um, SARS had some really strange features in terms of how it transmitted. Um, MERS doesn't seem to transmit from person to person well, um, but this particular virus does. And um, there was another question about um, whether this virus came from bats or from pangolins. Um, we're not really sure. Many of the other viruses came from bats through an intermediate species. And so one possibility is that this virus came from bats through pangolins. Um, that one piece of the virus that is different and that looks like a pangolin virus seems to be the part that's letting it transmit from person to person so easily. Um, and so that unique piece of this virus seems to be part of the unique uh, biology here. Um, someone else asked why some coronaviruses spill over um, while others don't. And in fact, it may be due to some of those genetic mutations that the viruses have picked up that allow them to interact with human cells a little bit better. Um, it seems, uh, so I also have a question about whether the body can naturally recover from um, this infection. Um, and um, the answer is it does seem to be so. Um, there are quite a lot of labs right now that are studying aspects of the immune system, but on the um, Johns Hopkins data that I showed you, I think there were something like 60,000 people who have recovered already from this infection. So it does seem as though your body can recover. And for many people who are in the young and healthy age group, it seems as though those people who uh, will recover um, quite well um, with only flu-like illness, if that. Um, I think those are all of the private questions. Okay, so if you want, if you can scroll back up to 824. Okay. Um, El Grillo. Okay. Um, the first question that came in. Okay, so the question is, do we know yet whether the virus remains in the body once a person's symptoms have subsided um, and could it reoccur? Um, that is actually one of the things that is being very uh, rapidly uh, investigated right now. Um, there are some patients who seem to have gotten better and then gotten worse somewhat closely thereafter. Um, in most cases, it looks like their body had not yet actually cleared the virus. Um, and so they had sort of started on the road to recovery, but hadn't quite gotten all the way there. Um, and so um, originally we thought that that was an example of recurrence, but now we actually think that those people had not completely recovered in the first place. Okay. Um, there's another one down by 827, but okay. from, Jeff from Jeffrey. Okay. Um, so Jeffrey asks, why does the coronavirus have a significantly greater impact on the elderly, but little to no impact on infants? Um, when we look at other diseases, they usually have a huge impact on both the infant population and on the elderly population. Um, Jeffrey, that's a really great question. And again, that's something that scientists are working on figuring out right now. Um, when I looked at the data um, regarding um, the SARS-CoV-2, um, my first question was about differences in immune responses between older people and between um, the younger kids. Um, and I think that that could very well be part of it. Um, one of my colleagues from graduate school is now um, an infectious disease pediatrician. Um, and when I've talked to her about that issue, she seems to think it has more to do with differences in the lungs between children and adults. Um, that children's lungs um, may be biologically different enough that they may not have as much damage. Um, and that is something that people are very much um, trying to um, uh, uh, work on and figure out right now. So earlier today, I received a question um, from someone uh, in the alumni at drew.edu box. Um, and the question was, I understand that those over 65, this is related to this, which, which is why I'm skipping to it. Mm -hmm. Those over the age of 65 are at greater risk, particularly if they have an underlying medical condition. 
What happens if those conditions are managed with medication? Blood pressure is controlled or AFib is managed. Are people with controlled conditions still at greater risk? Does relative physical fitness matter? Um, I think that anything that you can do in order to improve your health is going to improve your body's ability to respond. Um, and so in general, um, your health and being sort of healthy before potentially becoming infected will be important to help you do well um, should you become infected with this virus. Okay. And then I think if you keep scrolling down, I believe you answered some of these questions through your presentation. Okay. Um, I, I will point out that I see one person who asked the question of when I say we, who am I referring to? Um, that's actually a pretty common thing that scientists do where we say we when we mean the scientific community. Um, or groups of scientists. Um, and I think you can just keep scrolling. There are a lot of other, a lot of other questions, but I think you answered a lot of them. Okay. Um, so I see someone is asking about whether if someone recovers, um, whether they're immune to it. Um, the early data makes it look like the answer to that is yes. Um, that is something that scientists are still looking at. Um, I know that it may seem strange that I'm so frequently saying that's something that scientists are currently looking at. Um, but if you remember at the beginning, I told you that we are doing this somewhat faster than we've ever done before for most different infections. Um, and so there are lots of things that are still being worked out. Um, so Connor asks about the reproductive number. Um, the difference with reproductive number is that there has to do with um, issues of both um, how long an individual is infectious, what ways the virus can be spread. Um, and so Ebola and um, SARS-CoV-2 have very different um, ways that they're spread, um, ways that they're transmitted, as well as a lot of other different um, bio biological features. Um, and so it's a little bit difficult to make the comparison um, that uh, Connor is asking about. Um, and so there's more than just the reproductive number that will tell you about how many cases we might see. Um, so we have a question about whether the way that the virus is shaped affects the way that it spreads. Um, not to my knowledge, um, that's something that virologists really don't know a whole lot about. So other viruses, tend, they tend to all be somewhat round shaped, or at least that's one of the three major shapes. Um, I don't think that we know of any big impact on uh, shapes. Um, so I've mentioned quite a bit about uh, COVID versus um, influenza and um, uh, colds and flu. Um, someone asked about whether, about how the first cases were distinguished, and they were really distinguished because they were cases of severe pneumonia. Um, and so there probably were other cases that were misdiagnosed as cold or flu, who didn't have that same level of severe pneumonia at the beginning. Um, and they, and so that was why the first cases also happened to be quite serious cases. Um, we are still trying to investigate whether this virus is seasonal. Um, similar viruses do have a strong effect of humidity on their transmission. Um, I will also note, however, that if you look at places in the world where there are infections with this virus, um, there tend to be infections in many areas that are very warm. Um, and so it's hard to completely say that warm weather will make everything stop when we are seeing intense transmission in Iran, for example. Um, and so that's another one that we're trying to figure out um, and we're sort of working on um, right now. Um, let's see. Um, um, so someone asked if coronavirus and COVID-19 is the same thing. Um, coronavirus is a general group of viruses. COVID-19 is this particular epidemic. Um, there is another term, which is SARS-CoV-2, which is the name for the particular virus, which I, as a virologist, like to be picky about, but no one else seems to, so um, we're, we all are, you know, over that. Um, and let's see. Um, so someone else has asked about humidity. Um, 
someone has asked about tests and I think I would agree that there is uh, a lot of a lot to be said or a lot to think about in terms of testing. Um, we do have very strict rules for many aspects of um, medicine in the United States in order to make sure all of our um, medical products, medical tests are both safe and effective. Um, and so the FDA found it very important to make sure they had a test that was up to those standards. Um, but again, um, I, I will try to um, stay clear of making political comments. Um, what can we do to prevent a coronavirus pandemic like this from happening again? That's a really wonderful question. Um, and um, I think part of what we can do is we can start to um, improve general aspects of public health. I mentioned that some of the preventative measures that we're taking um, are going to be helpful against coronavirus, but also against viruses like um, influenza and the common cold. And so we may need to think about people generally not going to work when they're sick um, or taking other types of public health preventions. Scientists are also spending a lot of time trying to understand viruses in animals and what makes them spill over um, into people so that we can start to predict what viruses are out there um, and be ready for that transmission going on. Um, is it known how the virus affects pregnant women and newborns? Um, I have not seen any particular um, issues in newborns. There are a couple of very famous cases in China where pregnant women were infected and gave birth to perfectly healthy and also uninfected babies. Um, and so that is the biggest uh, piece of data that we have um, right now to address that question. Um, and uh, other protective measures I would assume would, I would say would largely be the same kind of sort of hygiene and social distancing measures um, that you might want to take. Um, someone else asked about whether they should wear a mask to school. Um, that is a really tricky question to answer um, because there are so many things about cultural practices um, with masks, um, whether or not masks are preventative for you spreading to others or others spreading to you. Um, masks do give you a little more humidity around your mouth, which may be helpful, but masks also are kind of annoying to wear um, and make you want to touch your face a lot. Uh, and so that can also be a bit more of a risk factor. Um, and so there is no one answer for all people surrounding masks. Um, and that's something that you need to kind of think about with individual infections. Um, if one were to touch their eyes and face and have particles on COVID-19 on them, would they then be infected? Possibly. That is a way one could be infected. It might matter how many COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 particles they had um, on them or uh, things like that. So it's not, I'm not going to say, yes, 100% of the time that's going to happen, but um, that is certainly the way that it works. Um, well, um, so Andrew asks whether there's a need for mass testing to get an accurate number. Right now, we wanna make sure that the people who are doing the testing are focused on testing those who are at the most risk of serious disease. And we wanna make sure that our healthcare system is focusing on those who need healthcare the most. Um, and so I don't know that there's a great need for everybody to go and get tested right now. Many people may get COVID-19 and stay home and feel like they have, have the flu and stay in bed for a little while and have tea and um, get past it in a few days. Um, and I'm not sure that right now we need those people to be going in for healthcare um, to further tax our medical system. It would be really useful for the scientific community to understand the numbers of people who are infected um, at some point in the future. But right now, I think that we need to prioritize those members of our community who are the most sick. Um, I have a question about why the virus lasts longer on some surfaces compared to others. That would be best answered by some of my chemistry colleagues. Um, but the answer has to do with how well the surface is able to um, bind to the virus and have the virus stick to it, as well as how well the virus is able to um, stay or keep from drying out on those surfaces. 
Um, so Peter mentioned something about the AT1R receptor. Um, the receptor um, that I've seen for this virus is called ACE2. Um, I'm not sure if AT1R is a different name for it, but my understanding is that the receptor for this virus is called ACE2, um, not something called AT1R. Um, someone wants to know whether the virus can be transmitted from someone who tested positive and is now deceased. Um, there are some viruses where we see that type of situation. Um, those viruses tend to be spread by things like blood. This virus tends to be spread by respiratory secretions. Um, I don't know if anyone has actually checked that yet. Um, my guess would be that is less likely. Um, let's see here. How many steps removed should a confirmed case be before precautionary measures are taken? Um, I think that really we want to be thinking about precautionary measures as ways to protect our community. Um, there are models that show, and this is also true of the data I showed you with um, St. Louis, um, that St. Louis actually was able to stop the 1918 flu epidemic because they took precautionary measures early when there weren't very many cases. And so I don't know that it's something we should think about in terms of individual um, separation uh, and more about protecting communities. Marissa also asked about my feelings on closing schools and I do think that protective measures may be very important for us. Um, CJ asks about um, rumors going around that the virus has mutated and split into two strains. This was based on a report that came out that said there were two strains. One was called the S strain and one was called the L strain. Um, there has been some pretty uh, um, intense examination of those two strains since that paper came out. And it now looks like the differences that were seen in the original paper were due to the numbers um, statistically of people sampled. And actually, if you look at those two viruses um, as they uh, replicate in people, there is no advantage of one over the other. There is really no difference. One, neither of them leads to more severe symptoms. Neither of them leads to um, any differences, any differences in transmission. Um, they seem to be sort of staying constant in terms of their relationship to one another. And so no, I, while there, there does seem to be some mutation happening in this virus, as viruses do, none of those mutations have really had much consequence. That rumor included the idea that this virus was changing its ability to transmit or changing its transmission type with these mutations. Just so you know, in the history of virology, we have never seen a virus mutate to change its type of transmission. Um, so that would be incredibly unlikely. Um, is it possible to get the virus from mail or packages? Um, I think that there are, we do see that the virus does spend some time um, persisting on cardboard, um, though it is not completely um, clear uh, whether or not um, you would be getting something from the mail. I think that the problem with the mail might be, I suppose, if you touched the surface of your package and then touched your face. And so I would assume that washing your hands there would be a useful preventative measure. Um, and um, uh, typically the alcohol that is needed to um, uh, deactivate the virus is alcohol at a very high percentage and it's sort of alcohol that is used in laboratories. Um, not, I would not use alcohol that is found at home. Um, there may be some effects in the lungs, although um, it does not seem as though um, people are having uh, a really long um, or a lot of pathology in their lungs. Um, so there's a question here about this virus as a bioweapon. Um, Wuhan is the location of the um, Wuhan Institute of Virology and the Wuhan virologists are some of the world's top virologists. In fact, um, they are experts at studying coronaviruses. Um, many, many, many people have examined the sequence of this virus and have not found evidence of tampering in the virus. 
Um, to me, um, I have examined it in close detail um, to answer this question for others in the past. And I see absolutely nothing that makes me think that this is not a natural virus. Um, and one of the things I have said to describe this to others is that perhaps I am just really lazy, um, but there are far too many random changes in the virus that look like the result of natural mutations um, that no one would have ever put there in the first place. So um, I, I see no reason um, why this might be a, a mechanism of um, uh, some type of bioweapon. It really does not um, look like something uh, that would be um, uh, leading to some kind of contamination. There are so many questions. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Um, so yes, the membrane found, uh, actually this, uh, this person asked whether the membrane found around the virus uh, prevents um, the body from eliminating the virus. In fact, your immune system actually binds to parts of that membrane and some of the proteins in that membrane. Um, and so um, the membrane actually is something your immune system detects, um, uh, not so much something that's actually going to prevent your immune system from detection. Um, someone asks about um, different types of sanitizers. Um, Clorox type sanitizers are very effective, but they are not something that is going to be useful on your skin. They are what are known as disinfectants, um, which are great for inanimate objects, um, but are not great for living tissue like your skin. In that case, you want to use something called an antiseptic. Um, and so um, in the lab, I tend to use alcohol-based sanitizers for my lab benches. Clorox sanitizers are also very effective. They are just different in terms of how harsh they are um, and some of the residues they leave that can be important in lab work that are not important in anyone else's life. Um, there, there are lots of questions here about what I think long-term is going to happen. I have to admit to you that I am not a, able to predict the future um, to talk about how various parts of the world are going to be affected. Um, Someone asks about whether Tamiflu will help. Tamiflu specifically blocks a step of um, replication of the influenza virus. Um, and this is a part of the virus biology that is completely different from coronaviruses. So Tamiflu will not help. Um, someone asks some question, some, a complex question about ACE2 um, and discrepancies between older and younger patients um, and their production of a molecule called angiotensin. Um, that is um, being examined. Um, so that, that is, is very unclear. Oh wow, Bill Campbell um, asked if any prescription drugs uh, change the likelihood of infection or, or seriousness if infected. Um, I have not seen any data, and to be honest with you, that is the first I have heard that question. Um, I am recording a podcast episode with uh, a number of different experts in the field tomorrow, and I can ask that question and find out the answer. Um, I'm not sure what some of those prescription drugs like prednisone would do. Um, Someone asks about the differences that we're seeing between um, the ninth um, and the uh, more recent dates and uh, comments on that. And my comment is yes, there are, this virus is rapidly increasing in number. Um, and uh, it, as an epidemic, it is spreading rapidly as one would expect. And so those, that is in fact to be expected, particularly as the number of people are uh, being tested um, and more and more people are tested. Um, it is possible to be a carrier um, and not show symptoms. Um, it is not clear that um, having patients uh, having patients together wouldn't necessarily worsen anyone's symptoms, but it would make it much more likely for the virus to spread. There is this phenomenon uh, that we think about a lot in 
terms of thinking about infectious disease of how many people need to be together in order for an infection to spread. And so the more people and the more densely those people are populated, um, the more likely we have spread. So it won't worsen anyone's individual symptoms, but it will allow for more chains of infection. Um, so Neil asks why antibiotics don't kill the virus. Antibiotics um, specifically act on parts of the life cycle of bacteria. Um, they act on things like the bacterial cell wall or bacteria's ability to make protein. And viruses don't have those things because viruses use our cells. And so it's hard to find a target for a virus that isn't also something that's in our cell and that's being used by our cells. Um, and so antibiotics specifically block parts of bacterial biology that viruses don't have. Um, I have not seen the data on how long the virus um, is uh, living on clothing. Um, and let's see here. Um, so someone asked about whether it would be possible to develop a vaccine that could um, be uh, working against coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Um, and that is entirely uh, possible. Um, one, it would be wonderful if we could look at a lot of the biology we know about and have a vaccine that blocked all coronaviruses, um, both those that cause the common cold, this particular coronavirus, SARS, MERS, and even some coronavirus that could um, stop, um, that could come in the future. Um, and so I think it would be fantastic to develop such a vaccine. And I really hope that scientists are able to do things like that. Um, someone has asked what I think is the threshold um, that's needed for schools to participate in a quarantine. That's one of those things where um, I, as a virologist, would need to hear from a lot of colleagues um, in a lot of different fields. There are lots of variables that are important there. They have to do with things like um, how many students, how closely packed those students are, are there a lot of students who are commuting or are they residential? Um, are there many students who have different types of immune compromise? Um, what types of hygiene measures are taking place? And those are things that I don't know about different individual um, schools. And so I can't make those decisions and the officials at those individual schools will really need to make those types of decisions. So I, I think that's pretty close to the uh, to the end, Brian. I think so too. Um, so I know everyone is interested in um, finding more information or staying in touch with you um, or in touch with the virology data. So do you want to plug the podcast? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm part of a podcast called This Week in Virology. Um, you can find it at microbe.tv. Um, and it's also on all of your different podcast players. Um, we record episodes on Friday and we release new episodes every Sunday. Um, we've been doing coronavirus episodes since mid-January um, and have been um, interviewing a number of different coronavirus experts. This week we will be talking with Ralph Barrick, who actually discovered some of the diverse coronaviruses I mentioned to you um, a little bit ago. And I would strongly recommend anyone who is interested um, can certainly take a look at that podcast um, and find any of our episodes either online or on podcast players. Um, you're also welcome to take a look at my Twitter feed uh, at Bioprof Barker. Okay, great. And we will, um, we will share that those links with all of you. Um, I think it's gonna, it's going to be I just looked I don't think it's up on our coronavirus site yet. But it will be up there at least the link to the podcast. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, um, Brian, for your great presentation. It sound, everyone had, everyone really appreciated it. Thank you very much for um, being a part of this, everyone. I hope this was helpful. It sounds like everyone thinks it was very helpful. Great. Thanks, Brianne. It was great, Brianne. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Super job, Brianne. Thank you.
Dior. Yay, Brie. Thanks, <laughs> Steve. Awesome. And if that's you love Bill awesome Campbell, job, thank man. you. It was, it, was, it was awesome. I loved it. Thanks. I had my phone off in case you were texting me. <laughs> of course. You better turn it back on. You might find a, about 40 texts. It's kind of what I expected. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be in touch when we get offline. Okay. Sounds good. See ya. See ya. Bye, guys. Thank you both for doing this. Uh, Carol for the logistics and Brienne, of course, for just uh, an incredible presentation. And I'm sure people are awed by the fact that uh, Drew students have professor professors like you. Thank you so much, Marianne. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Marianne. Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Well, as they're signing off, that went really well. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that was what you were, what you all were looking for. I tried, I took what I had talked to my students about. Um, so I wasn't sure if that was what the public wanted as well, but it was what I had. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it was, I think it was great. And um, we're planning to get it up on YouTube. Great. Um, also, so, um, so we can push it out to more people. Okay. That Someone one accidentally wrote on the slide, because uh, I had annotation on apparently, so. Yeah, um, one thing I've learned in all of the um, Zoom trainings um, is the importance of turning off that uh, annotation. Um, yeah. I worked with some students um, yesterday on Zoom and they were practicing being in class and started doing what they thought would be taking notes and ended up taking notes all over my screen. Uh -huh. um, so <laughs> we've learned a lot about turning off um, annotation. Yeah, I learned that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay. There's also a way that you can have it tell you who's drawing. So if someone draws something that you don't want, it says their name next to it. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. I did not see that. So I just kept trying to erase it and I don't think I couldn't, I could not get it erased, so. We only figured out how they could erase their own. Gotcha. Okay. Well, it's already shut off for all future Zoom meetings. Excellent. <laughs> I think we're all learning a lot about Zoom right now. Yeah, exactly. It's great and it's so amazing because five years ago we, this wouldn't have been possible. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's really amazing all of the things that we're able to do um, with technology. And I know that, you know, when, as we've been trying to pull together what we're going to do about classes, um, it has been very, very, very um, amazing to see all of the things that we're going to be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be pretty awesome. Yeah. So, um, Okay. Well, I think I think it's time to end the meeting. Okay. <laughs> um, but thank you again. I am so appreciative of all your work. Um, no problem. Thank you so much. your willingness to jump in so quickly to put this together. Sure. No problem. Alrighty. All okay. right. Good night. Bye. Bye.